Hello class. Welcome to our lecture. Uh, we are going to talk about, as you can see here on this first slide, hidden Markov models and their uses for analyzing sequential data. All right, so first, before we dive in, we'll motivate hidden Markov models with a discussion of some sequential data schemes uh, and uh, or just sequential data examples, I should say. Uh, and so there are many machine learning problems and machine learning scenarios where we are asked to analyze, extract information from, and or classify sequential data. So what is sequential data? And from a very simple mathematical standpoint, we can see this as a mapping from some ordinal set, some index set, some time set, right, to some measurable range. Right. So a really good example of this, and a very common example of this, would be something like speech recognition, right, where we clearly have a time signal, right, a progression across time, and measurements across this progression. Hidden Markov models have a history of uh, good application and good use to speech recognition problems. Right, a very common application of hidden Markov models, as well as other time series analysis tools. Target tracking and or pose recognition is also a great example of sequences of events right, and or time signals, right, which can be analyzed for the purposes of classification and or tracking. In today's world where we have Uber drivers and we have autonomous vehicles, and the idea of tracking navigation is also a very important and timely problem. Uh, another fun application to a hidden Markov model or for a, a hidden Markov model. A common problem encountered in data science and data analytics and certainly one of great interest uh, with respect to industry and marketing and, and potential job markets is uh, financial forecasting. Right. You'll see a lot of data sets up on Kaggle, uh, a lot of data sets for review for analysis where you're asked to predict stock prices or to financially uh, uh, perform predictions on financial markets. And so this is also a sequential progression. You can see this as a time series. And so a good application for a hidden Markov model or some other uh, sequential data analysis tool. There are other sequences in nature as well. Uh, DNA, RNA sequences, a really good example of sequential data in biology and biological applications. And so we can see that there is a wide range, all the way from biology to sound recognition, audio classification, uh, and financial markets, etc., where we have sequential data and encounter sequential data. And in many of these applications, we wish to extract information, uh, identify states or sequences for the purposes of classification or other. Uh, many standard machine learning tools do not necessarily explicitly account for this temporal information, that is the sequence in which we have these observations, but rather deal with and analyze these observations independently or not necessarily within the context of a sequence. And so sequential models, the main goal and the main difference between sequential models and non-sequential models is that we wish to clearly explicitly take advantage of this sequential information, the temporal information. All right, so what is a sequential process? Again, we have some sort of progression, right? This can be a progression across time or some sort of ordered set, some index set, Within the context of hidden Markov models, we'll introduce some nomenclature here uh, and derive this statistically speaking. So here we'll define a sequential process to be a system which can occupy one of n states. So here we'll define a discrete sequence. And this is essentially our time index t. So we have our index set uh, x of t. 
we will define this to be a stochastic process. Therefore, it is being governed by probability distributions. We'll further specify this to say that any joint distribution can be found or factored into a series of conditional distributions. And we'll take advantage of this and we'll make some assumptions on this. Right. This factorization here is simply a breakdown of probability laws. And this is often referred to as the chain rule of probability. Uh, and within a Markovian assumption, we are gonna break this down even further. So a Markov process is a process where the next state only depends on the current state. What does this mean? Well, this is an, a, an extraordinary simplification, especially for sequential processes or temporal processes. Right? As you may have a history of observations, and the next observation will almost surely in a temporal process depend on what you've seen in the past. What a Markovian assumption set does is say that all of these observations in the past are not useful except for the very last one. Right? I shouldn't say are not useful, but uh, our new observation will not depend on all of these observations in the past except for the immediately preceding observation. And so we have this uh, equation here at the top saying that x sub t plus 1, given all of our previous observations, x sub 0 to x sub t, is simply the same as x sub t plus 1 given x sub t, right? meaning that all of the observations before time t are not needed. They will not change the probability. They will not change the distribution of our next observation. Right. Uh, another interpretation of this is simply you could state that conditioned on the present, the past and future are independent, which is a, another sort of an extension of this Markovian rule. Right. So in many processes, is this an oversimplification? Yes, almost surely. Right. However, this will make the calculization uh, or optimization, the calculation of inference uh, more practical and uh, therefore will allow us to, in a real world sense with real world data, learn, tweak, and tune these models to solve real world problems. And given uh, a stationary Markov chain, and since each next state is on next observation only depends on the previous one, right, we will often characterize these processes using a transition matrix. That is, given that we're in some state, what is the probability that we will transition to another state? So again, this is our probability of x sub t, given our x uh, sub t plus 1, given x sub t. So given that time t, we're in state j, what's the probability we'll be in state i in the next time index? Right. This is simply referred to as a state transition matrix. For those of you familiar with state transition diagrams or finite state machine-like diagrams, right, that's a good example here. Our state transition matrix is shown here on the left and the corresponding diagram is shown here on the right, indicating probability on the edges given that we're in state one, for example, and we are going to transition to state three, the probability of that is 20%. Right, this is shown in the lower left column in the transition matrix, given that we are in state one and going to state three. And then you can clearly identify this in the corresponding diagram as well on the right-hand side. All right, so this gives us a lot of information about our temporal process as it helps us to identify given our simple Markovian assumption, right, probabilities of going from one observation or having one observation and transitioning to another, or seeing two observations in sequence. All right, so given this, given that this transition matrix is analogous to a, a transition diagram or a, a graph with edges. Uh, it is important to note that hidden Markov models as well as many statistical models can be represented as a graph. 
where edges in this graph indicate some sort of causal relationship, transition probability, something of this nature, some sort of Markovian property or relationship correlation between nodes. So the nodes indicate states and or some random variables, and the edges indicate these relationships between the variables. Again, in our, in our case, it'll be a Markovian indicating that they are neighboring. Therefore, we can calculate joint distributions by aggregating probabilities across these edges. Right? And so shown here, a joint distribution P of X is simply going to be the product of all of these P's given their parents. Again, given the Markovian assumption, each probability is only going to depend on each node's parents. Right? These are the neighboring nodes. Given a chain, which is our temporal process here, we can further simplify this graphical model from a directed acyclic graph or DAG down to a simple chain. And this chain is just our simple sequence where we go from one index, one time index to the subsequent one or to the, um, to the next one. Right? And each of these represents some state transition. And so here we are in some state uh, at time zero, right, we have x zero. We then have some observation x of one, right, x of two, and so on and so forth. And so this is our transition from states to state with corresponding probabilities here. Again, here our nodes represent the states, and the edges represent our Markovian property. And given this, we can now simplify our probability as follows. Right? That we have our probability of x is simply equal to the probability of x sub 1 times the product of from t ranging from 2 to capital T, where capital T is the total number of observations in our sequence. Right? x sub t given x sub t minus one. And so here again, since we only have a Markovian dependency, we can aggregate probabilities of each node given the previous. Note here that we can extend this Markovian property and have slightly more complicated or what we refer to as higher order chains. Right? Uh, right? This would complicate the calculation of the joint. Right, but not significantly if we have the ability to simplify it or constrain it to some degree. In many applications, it's going to be natural to define the states in some continuous Euclidean space right, rather than a discrete space. And, and so depending on our applications, we may wish to do this or have these models in a using a discrete random variable or using a continuous random variable. We'll look at some examples moving forward here later on in the slides. All right, now, so what makes this model a quote unquote hidden model? Well, the states are what's hidden in this model. So this is a, a very interesting, powerful, and useful model in that our hidden Markov model will essentially have these latent states. These states are unknown to us. They're unknown to the learner. Right? They're not necessarily explicitly given in the data. Right? Instead, it's the job of our learning tool to learn these states which is really cool and one of the main benefits of using a hidden Markov model as compared to other temporal models. So in our training data, we don't know the states. We don't have labels for the states. The states are completely unknown. What we do have access to are observed processes. So we have a sequence of observations, right? T of them, right? Here we indicate them with uh, using variable Y. And we have these 
states which are hidden to us, x sub 1 to x sub 1. And so since these hidden states are latent, we will then need to try to identify or estimate what state we're in, given some observation y. And we may have many more observations than states, right? One of these might be continuous, one of them might be discrete. Right? We have a discrete number of states, but the observations might be continuous. They might be discrete. There might be a completely different number, though. We might not have a one-to-one -one correspondence between observations and states, for example. In fact, that's rare. And otherwise, you need not use a hidden Markov model. All right, so what does this mean with respect to inference? Well, onto this, we can now also aggregate within our joint the probability of our observation given a state. And so it's assumed that our states, and as you can see from this diagram, that the state we're in will affect our observation. Right? Another way of saying that is our, what we observe is conditioned on the state we are currently in. All right, so given our sequence of observations y, we will then be faced with some number of problems. One of them might be trying to determine what state we're in at each time, try to continue, try to determine the state sequence, or possibly a, a classification problem. Again, depending on the problem we're faced, we may have a need for some of these different solutions. All right, so again, this is our simple breakdown. Our hidden states, we have our sequence of observations. Given that x sub t provides no additional information about the future, right, we have the following simplification of our joint for the observations y. That is p of y sub t in the future conditioned on x sub t and p and y uh, sub t minus one in the past, right? we can simply say that our observations are only based on the current state we're in. Right? And we can see that in this diagram here. And so these are called state uh, conditional probabilities. That is our observation and each observation is conditioned only on the current state at that time which is hidden from us. All right. So if these states are hidden, why are we trying to model them? What's useful? Well, in many applications, we have some observations, which are not necessarily observations of great interest, but they are useful information which might help us to characterize some underlying phenomen phenomenon or phenomenology, the root of which is the root of or the crux of the problem we're trying to solve. Right. And so, so for example, if we're in some sort of state of climate, right? I'm not a climatologist, but uh, you know, just, we're in some sort of state, uh, emergency state or storm state or hurricane state, we don't necessarily have information privy to that. But what we might have is some other information or some other observations such as uh, wind, rain, et cetera. And so in this, in this situation, we might have these states. We might not know what state we're currently in. We do have some observations. And based on these observations and sequences of observations, we might wish to estimate our current states. Right? For example, we might have a sequence of financial data. And we might have some number of states, such as uh, the market is excellent, right? or we're in a depression. Right? And so we might not necessarily know that we're in a depression. Right? This might be a state of the market. Right? However, given some observations, such as stock prices over time, bond prices over time, we might be able to identify when we have entered a depression and or when we are leaving a depression, entering that state and or leaving that state based on these observations. Right. So the state itself, whether we're in a depression or not, is hidden from us. These observations are, are presented to us. We have temporal sequential observations. 
All right. So here's the big picture of a hidden Markov model. So we have these observations, we have these states, we have sequential data, and we have the Markovian assumption, which uh, helps us to govern how the sequence and the sequential processes are characterized. And so we have some alphabet, we have some set of states, we have our transition probabilities, we have our initial probability to start the sequence, and we have our emission probabilities. These are also referred to as the state conditional probabilities. These are the probability of each observation given some state. Right. So given some sequence, one piece of nomenclature here is to identify a parse. Right. Well, what does that mean? Well, here we have a grid of all of our states. Let's say we, in this example, we just have our K states. Right, but then we have some number of observations T. So the going down, we have at each time index represented by a column here. We can be in K possible states. And then when we're in one of these states, we can then transition moving on to the right to the next time sequence and the next time index. And we can do this T times. All right, so we'll start off here in our first time observation. And let's say for the sake of this example, we're in state two. All right, given this, given our observation, and right, we can then determine which state is most likely next in the sequence. So we have a full sequence of observations, Y. Right, based on the current state we're in, and then based on the next observation we receive, we will then attempt to determine the transition probability for all of the next states. Right, conceptually speaking here. And so this would be a parse. And so this would be, given our sequence of observations, we might say that this is a likely sequence of hidden states. That is, we started off in state two, then we went to state one, then to state K, and then we ended up in state two. Right, so we parsed our sequence of observations and determined a state sequence. All right, so that's one bit of information, one important bit of information uh, with respect to hidden Markov models. Understanding that idea, right, that we have this huge grid of state transitions. We're moving through this grid from left to right. These are hidden states. We determine it is one of the main goals of a hidden Markov model, either for the purposes of learning or for the purposes of inference or the purposes of estimating state. Well, we need to determine our path through or viable paths through this grid. And this will allow us to compute probabilities. This will allow us to infer and or learn. All right. So with our discrete state HMMs, here we will assume that we have, again, some finite states. Our observed processes could be continuous or discrete. And we have these probabilities here. Right. If we have a discrete observations, if we have discrete observations, then we'll model each of the Y random variables using some discrete model. And we'll have some discrete symbol, or we could have the Ys being continuous, right? You can model them using Gaussian or something similar. And in either case, since we have our Markovian assumption and the graphical assumption that we've shown previously, these probabilities are conditioned only on the current state that we're in at time t. So the three main questions, three main problems that we face with an HMM, like another way of, of saying that is, when would we want to use an HMM when we're trying to solve what problem? One is to simply evaluate what is the probability of an observation sequence? And another way of saying this is, you know, if we have an observation sequence, maybe we want to classify that sequence, right? So classification, that's great. 
We want to compute the probability of a sequence. How likely is it for us to observe this sequence of occurrences? Another is decoding. That is identifying the states. Maybe we don't necessarily care about classifying a sequence. Right. So an example of classifying a sequence might be uh, pose estimation, or maybe you have some video information of uh, a karate expert doing some karate moves, and it's your goal to identify the move sequence. Or another example would be for voice uh, recognition, or not voice recognition, but let's say word recognition, trying to identify the words in a spoken language. Right. If you have a time sequence, right, you may wish to classify the entire sequence and identify words. Right. So that would be in a good example, two good examples of number one here, classifying the entire sequence. Problem two says you want to identify state or state sequences. And right? so you're not necessarily trying to classify the entire time signal, but here you just maybe you're only interested in identifying the state you're in at one of the time indexes, or maybe the state you're in at two or three of the time indexes, or maybe you just want to identify how long you might be in a depression or how long you're in a particular state. Right? Uh, and so identifying, if your main goal is to identify the state or states that are hidden, right? this is referred to as the decoding problem. The last problem we face with hidden Markov models is the learning problem. That is the optimization of the hidden Markov model itself. Right, so the first two here are problems that we face for the use and application of the model. Right, and the third one is having to do with the optimization of the model itself. All right, so given our terms here, let's go ahead and try to tackle some of these problems here. How can we evaluate or compute the probability of an entire sequence? Right. A really good question. Well, given the, the fact that we have all these possible paths through this grid here, and we want to know the probability of the entire sequence, observation sequence, and it's conditioned on each of these different paths. In order to compute the exact probability, we would have to sum over all possible state sequences, which is not feasible. So there's a number of other alternatives that one can employ here. Right? That is, we can try to identify the most likely sequence and just compute the probability of that sequence. Or maybe the most likely sequences and compute the probability across that. And we can also look at some of these algorithms and we will uh, moving forward here. The application of forward backward algorithm, how can we identify these likely sequences, uh, the Turby algorithm, et cetera. And problem number two is identifying the states. How can we infer the states given our observation sequence? Well, there's a, a few bits of information we can do here and a number of different ways we can look at this problem. Number one is a very simplified way to look at this problem. We could say, well, since each of these observations are conditioned only on each state, and if, we, if we want to try to identify at time index, let's say i, what state we're in, we can just look at the observation at i and then say which state is most likely given right, this observation. Seems pretty straightforward and simple, right? right? And that's not a terrible thing to do. It's just a bit of an oversimplification uh, because you're ignoring all the past data and all the future data. Why, why could it be a bad thing to ignore all the past data or previous data? Well, just an extreme example here is that it might not be possible for us to be in a particular state at time index i, given our previous data, right? Given the state transition matrix, for example, right? Just given some observation, if, if we were to say that any of the states are viable, right? maybe state j is the most 
is the most likely given our observation at time i. Right? However, given the previous sequence of observations, the probability of us transitioning to this state i, right, or, or that state at that time is zero. And so we can actually choose a state that's impossible given our previous data. So that's the downside of ignoring previous data. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we should probably take into account the sequential information when estimating the state, even if we only are interested in the state at a particular time index t. And so we can take in historical information, past information, when determining the optimal state sequence up to some point. And if we're privy to this information, we can also take in future observations. And so we can look at past observations and future observations and use this information to identify the most valid, the most likely state sequence given our sequence of observations. Well, how can we do this? Well, we can look at this as an optimization problem. We have our state conditional observations. We have our state transition uh, probabilities. And we have our state conditional probabilities, excuse me. And given this, we can come up and factor out these terms and pose this as an optimization problem. Right. And it's looking at this from a feed forward we can try to predict in a forward sense, starting off in a particular state, having some observation, right, and computing the corresponding probability. Right. We can also look at this from a from backward standpoint, that is, Given that we end up in some prob, uh, some end state, we can compute the most likely probability going backwards in time, right? thus allowing us to use future information, if you will, with respect to inference at time index t. So here, we're computing the probability of x given t, uh, x sub t given y, excuse me, right? in terms of our past information and future information. So here, we're using forward time and reverse time to identify the most likely state we can be in given our observation y. Again, we're taking in forward and backward information. This is referred to as forward backward algorithm and allows us to update these probabilities, taking into account the entire sequence. Right, given this, we can then come up uh, with an optimization criteria and optimize the parameters for our models. The parameters being the state transitions, the state conditional probabilities. Note that, or it can be shown, I should say, that given this optimization problem, our goal is to find an optimal sequence as it happens, we can identify this optimal sequence in terms of optimal subsequences. Thus, we can use dynamic programming. Right. This is a very common, very famous application of dynamic programming, right. referred to as Viterbi algorithm. And again, it simply says that we can solve for this optimal sequence in terms of optimal subsequences using a simple reverse time backtracking procedure. And very similar to, to most dynamic programming solutions. Right. Here I'll just go over a few of the optimization criteria that one might use in this, and then we will look at a fun application for hidden Markov models. Right. So here, looking at this maximum likelihood uh, optimization here, right, given our parameters, given the state emissions or the state conditionals, right, we want to identify and maximize over our parameters. And so here we have our observation 
parameters in theta. And we also have our state transition. The state transitions can be learned by simply counting, right? At least that's a common way to do this. And right? just coming up with a count, how many times in our state sequence we transition from one to another during this uh, learning process during the optimization scheme. And since we have our latent variables and we don't necessarily know which state we're in, it's a very good application of the expected uh, expectation maximization um, approach or scenario. And so applying EM within this context or within this scenario is very intuitive. Our E step here is simply to use our current parameters to estimate the state. And then we can at that point maximize. And I encourage you guys to review the Ravner tutorial that I've posted. This is a standard, right, the standard, the de facto tutorial for hidden Markov models. I realize that it seems a bit old, but hidden Markov models, al although there are many variants that have uh, cropped up in the literature over time and over the past couple decades, at the base hidden Markov model has not really changed since since then. So. Uh, I encourage you guys to read it. It's very approachable, very readable. It's a great tutorial, uh, so uh, which is why I posted it. So I encourage you guys to read it. It goes over the the learning algorithms, uh, the E steps, the the M steps, and all the update equations, etc. I'm not going to bore you with all the math here, right? But you can read over it and peruse it at your leisure. Right. Well, given our models, we can then, once we learn the model or tune the model, we can then perform classification. Right. We can also use this as an objective criterion or an optimization criterion right, within the purposes of um, learning as well. All right. So as promised, I wanted to inject a fun application of hidden Markov models. So we looked at all sorts of different data types, sequential data types, where we can use hidden Markov models, such as uh, stock data or climate data or pose estimation or tracking information, biological data applications. In many applications, however, and uh, in many applications, we see the clear relationship between a hidden Markov model and a time signal, right? What's interesting is that many things that aren't necessarily time signals, we can interpret as time signals or view as time signals and then use these different types of models. This is something that's interestingly done a lot in image processing, which is gonna be one of our next topics we discuss in class, right? Although images may or may not be actual time signals, at least in the X and Y dimensions or in the image space, Right. So they are often assumed to be or perceived to be for the purposes of analyses. Right. So this is very common, for example, in Fourier analysis of an image, where you assume that these, in fact, are time signals. Right. And then you would perform various time signal processes and or processing and or filtering on an image as though it was a time signal. Right. In some of my previous research, we did this to ground penetrating radar data, right? which is very much a time signal, though not necessarily in the, in the dimensions of the image. And what we, what we did here is applied a hidden Markov model across an image, right? across just one pixel line in an image, and we did it for each pixel line. And we tried to identify patterns that would crop up given the problem at hand. And we tried to characterize this and see if we could learn some hidden states based on the underlying phenomenology. So first I'll talk a little bit about the data and then show you what we learned. And so ground penetrating radar data is just simply a 
three-dimensional cube of data where we have reflectance points or reflectance in uh, intensities from each three-dimensional location underground. So a radar is essentially uh, pushed over or, or uh, moved over some swath of Earth. And then we have various reflection intensities for each X, Y, Z coordinate underground. A subsurface object is observed as a hyperbola. So here in this cross image, cross section, you can sort of see this hyperbola, if you will, or partial of a hyperbola, right? Looks like a parabola, but it's actually a hyperbola, right? indicating that there is an object there. So our goal of classifiers would be to identify this hyperbola. In much of our research, we focused on feature extraction because, well, classifiers are only as good as the features or data you feed into them. So we spend a lot of time trying to identify these shapes. In image processing, we have a whole bunch of different types of features we can produce. A lot of them are based on uh, edges. And so here's some pre-processing steps we did to uh, identify these edges. And after we computed these edge features, right, we identified them as having rising edges, right, falling edges, right, essentially edges at different degrees. So a rising edge, a falling edge, a flat edge, et cetera. Right? And we did so by just aggregating values over these small neighborhoods, these small windows. Right. Now, the idea here is, well, given all of these different edge intensities, can we identify states right, as we scan our image from left to right? And if so, what sort of states would we be able to identify? Because they're hidden. They're not something we're going to incorporate into training data and say that, well, we're in this you know, rising edge state or this falling edge state or mind state one or mind state two as we scan from left to right in the image. But could these be learned? And so here, again, we're taking a cross section of this image. We're scanning from left to right, right? We're treating this scan from left to right as a time signal, right? We have our observed features. And are we and our goal is, you know, are we observing state sequence that indicates a mine or some sort of subsurface object? Or are we observing a state sequence indicating a non-subsurface object? Well, here is an example of experiments we ran using eightfold cross-validation. Right? We initialized the hidden Markov model with four states. Right. On the right-hand side, we have our initial probabilities and our state transition probabilities. On the left, for each of these eight folds, I have, we have colored dots in this feature space. This is a two-dimensional feature space, indicating the rising and falling edges. And the dots indicate the mean value of the Gaussian that's being used, or that was learned right, for each of these state conditional models. And so if we were to zoom in on one of these and analyze them a little bit, what do we see? One thing to note in that each of these models, right, we have these four essential boxes that are learned in our feature space. So the features that are learned or the Gaussians that are learned is there's essentially one in the lower left-hand corner, one in the upper right-hand corner, one in the lower right-hand corner, and one in the upper left-hand corner. So what pattern is characterized when we scan from left to right in a target model? Right, well, here we have initial probability is high for state four. So this indicates that we're going to start in state four. Right, so that was the initial probability that was learned in our hidden Markov model. Right. Our transition model says that we stay in state four quite often. So that staying, once we're in state four, we're gonna stay there for a while, right, until we get an observation that just tells us, all right, we're actually gonna transition now. 
right? As it happens, if we look at our map over here, state four is the state, the black state in the diagram, indicating that we have very little features. So this is essentially a state where we have no observations. This is like a background state, if you will. Right, there weren't any rising edge features or falling edge features. We just had no features. Right, what's the next highest probability to transition to? Well, the next highest probability to transition to would be to state transition three. Right, so which one is that? Well, that indicates that we have, given our sequence here, this is the rising edge feature dimension, and this is the falling edge feature dimension. So state three actually indicates that we have a rising edge, right? Our features indicating that we have about a 45 degree feature. Well, that's pretty cool. So when we're in state three, we're likely to stay in state three or either go back to state four or state two. Well, state two right, is the falling edge. When we're in state two, we're likely to stay in state two, right, or very likely to go to state uh, one. Right, our falling edge, or back to state four. And so what does this mean? This means that given our data, our hidden Markov model actually learned these states intrinsically. It learned that it was important to identify this rising edge, this falling edge, right? As we scanned in our image from left to right. And these were sort of hidden, right? It learned this phenomenology on its own, which is pretty cool. Note that it also learned a similar phenomenology even when we trained this model with only three states. It simply decided to ignore the background state right, and focused on rising edge, falling edge, right, and a flat edge in the middle. Again, here the pattern characterized a likely state sequence given the mine data was this hyperbola, which was what we observed in the data. All right, well, that's a fun application of hidden Markov models. Uh, one that you probably wouldn't see uh, or hear of very often in the literature. And we had a lot of success using these hidden Markov models for subsurface object detection. Right? And for those of you who are doing some time signal processing for your projects in the class, I would encourage you to investigate hidden Markov models as they are quite useful for classification problems and, and or determining latent states. All right, guys, well, thanks for joining me, uh, and I will see you next time.